unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Hebrews chapter 12, from the 18th verse. The Bible says, For ye are not come unto the mountain that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated, that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned and thrust through with a dart. And so terrible, the Bible says, was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear. All right? But the Bible says in verses 22, but she are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood sprinkling that speaketh better things, things than that of Abel. Paul begins by showing us the two covenants, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when he's addressing the New Testament believer, he tells you that you have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched. You have not come to a mountain that is burning with brimstone. You're not coming to a mountain well, with the words that were heard was so exceedingly threatening that the people were not able to hear. Even Moses, the Bible says, he exceedingly feared and quaked to hear. And that is a dispensation of the Old Testament. The Bible says in Romans that when it comes to the law, the law is for those that are under the law. It's meant for them that are under the law. The law is not meant for people who are not under the law. The law is meant for people which are under the law. The Bible says that all mouths will be stopped and that all men will be guilty before God. So the things that the law says are not for everybody. All right? They're not for everybody. In the New Testament dispensation, we have another message. And that message is different from the old message. All right? The message of old was a threatening message. The message of old was a judging message. The message of old, men withdrew from because it was overwhelming to hear with its judgment. It was so terrible in the ears of some of the hearers because they were under a certain dispensation of God's judgment. All right? And when Jesus Christ is speaking to us through the Apostle Paul, he says, we have not come to that kind of mountain. He says, the mountain that you have come to is Zion. It is the city, he says, of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to a different mountain. But when you talk about these mountains, what do we mean? Because some people think, oh, Zion, the physical mountain. But what does it mean when he says that you have come to the mountain of Zion, which is the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem? There's some deep God is trying to give us there. It's a deep experience God wants to give you and I, and this is something I want to connect you to this evening by the grace of God. Now, if we are to study Zion, when he says you've come unto Zion, what is Zion? Historically, what is Zion? Yeah? Zion is a hill that is south of the mountain Moriah, all right? And it is south of the mountain Moriah in the land of Moriah, all right? And the city is Jerusalem. So Jerusalem city is in the land of Moriah. And at the mountain of Moriah 
The sides in the south is Zion as well, which is a hill on the mountain of Moriah. Now, why is it called Zion? Zion is translated as the patched place, all right? And it is the highest peak, all right, on that part of the mountain. I want you to follow that because there's something important I want you to pick there. So because it was the highest place, it was favorable for many things. And scripturally, the Bible tells us it was the place where the temple was built. In Psalms 78, verses 68 to 69, the Bible says, But he chose the tribe of Judah and the Mount of Zion, which he loved. And the Bible says, And he built his sanctuary, that's God, like high places, like the earth, which he had established forever. So where was it built? It was built in Zion. The temple was built in Zion, but in the land of Moriah. And where is Jerusalem? In the land of Moriah. I don't want you to miss that. Jerusalem is a city in the land of Moriah. And in the land of Moriah is a mountain of Moriah. And on the mountain of Moriah, besides it on the south, there is a hill called Zion. And it's the highest peak. And that's where the center was put. That's where the temple was built. That was the place that men connected to for worship and to God. Zion was a place of salvation. It was a place of life. It was a place of retribution and deliverance for the children of Israel. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 2 verses 3, if you read your Amplified Bible, it says, And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we say the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Of course, Jerusalem is the city, all right? The mountain Moriah, the hill, or you might want to call it a mountain, but it's connected to Moriah in the land of Moriah. And it says where the temple was, Zion, he says that was the place of instruction, the highest peak, the highest level. And I want you to think that from the physical and shift it into the spiritual understanding. The highest peak, right, of the mountain Zion, which is the house of God and housed the temple. He said it was a place where men went to be taught the ways of God. They went to learn the ways of God that they might walk in his paths. He said in Zion there was the teaching of the law and instruction. The word of God came from there. You know, it's the highest level of reach, the deepest place of reach in God, depending on the time and dispensation when he was dealing with the children of Israel in that time, was the place where the temple was. And there men went to be taught. Men went to be instructed in the ways of God. Men went to be taught in the ways of the law of our God. There was teaching, the word of God was in Zion. And that is why there salvation was. That is why there healing was. That is why there deliverance was. That is why there blessing was. That is why there breakthrough was. Because there was much teaching. And I want you to follow me here. Now, we go back to the land of Moriah. We go back to the understanding of the land of Moriah. Like I said, in the land of Moriah is the city of Jerusalem. And in the land of Moriah is the mountain of Moriah. And south of that mountain is the hill of Zion, where the prince of God is, where the temple was erected by Solomon, and where men were taught. Now, when we go to Moriah, when you study scripture, you realize that the word Moriah, the name Moriah, means to see or perceive Jehovah, to see or perceive Jehovah. Or rather, you can divine Moriah as the revelation or the revealed of God, the revelation of God or the revealed of God, the revealed things of God, okay? You know, it's in the land Moriah, in the place where we perceive and see God and are revealed of God or the things of God is a mountain Moriah. And besides that, the highest peak is a mountain or a hill called Zion, and up there is the temple of God, and men go there to be taught the law and instruction of God that they might understand the ways of God. They might know and see the ways of God. They might know him as he is. They might have the full revelation of this person 
of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's Moriah. It's the place, right? It's in the land where men see. So Moriah and its reputation as a place of where men perceive and see God, all right? And what is God telling you and I? Common sense. That the place of perceiving or seeing God, of understanding the revealed things of God, begins when we can have consecrated places where we can be taught of him, touching his ways, his instruction and laws. We cannot know God only by our experiences, because our experiences vary on where we are at with God. And where we are at with God does not mean God necessarily has drawn the boundary of his knowledge of where every individual is at. Each one of us has their personal experiences with God. But why is Zion placed on the highest peak? Why is the temple on one of the highest peaks? It is the highest realm defined in Jerusalem, the city of God, the city of peace, the teaching of peace. In fact, Jerusalem is translated as the teaching of peace, all right? He said it's slated on the highest plain in Jerusalem, in the land where we're supposed to perceive and see God, carry the revelation of God and the things of God. And up there, he says, I teach. Up there, he says, I reveal my paths. Up there, he says, that I show you my instructions. My word comes from there. And because of that, you are blessed. Because of that, you are healed. Because of that, you have a breakthrough. Because of that, you are saved. Salvation comes to you. Because of that, you are changed. Because of that, you are renewed. Because of that, you are transformed. You are metamorphosed. There's a somorphosis that happens in your spirit. Why? Because he has elevated you to the highest level. The highest place in God is when a man can be taught a certain way. That's what I'm trying to say. The highest degree of the presence of God is not the demonstration of the power of God, of the lamb walking, the blind seeing, and the deaf hearing. God could actually do that even without a man. But by his grace, he has chosen to do that with us. But even if a man was not available, God could still do a miracle. We have seen the glory of the Shekinah. God has done things before without any indulgence of a man. And he has done it perfectly because his God is 100% God. He's perfect in all his ways. The miracle of creation was done without a man. In the beginning, when he said, let there be light, there was no human existence. But that I mean that the creative force of God was frustrated. He could have done without us. He chooses through his divine love and mercies to share in that glory of creating with you and I. So we are procreators with him. We partake of that divine nature and have the ability to create things. But he's saying the highest level, the highest place of my dwelling is in Zion, where I'm able to teach men where I'm able to instruct men in my ways, where I'm able to reveal my laws to men. And it is in the land where men are supposed to perceive or see, get the revelation of who I am as God and the things that touch me. Some people take lightly the glory of the word. If God has given me a mandate in our dispensation, he has given me a conviction heavy beyond words I can articulate that men should be drawn back to understanding that there is no breakthrough in our dispensation if we are disconnected from the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ through his word. The reason why you see a lot of mayhem and destruction, even in the body of Christ, the lack, the suffering, the deaths, you know, the divisions that we have, the misinterpretation of things, the people who have been in the gospel for 30 or 40 years, and a man says something and you are shocked that he has been walking in the gospel and has been in active ministry and has a successful ministry, but the way he has interpreted the word is just so off and you can tell that he's not told of God or that the ministry has been sustained for a long time by the gifting on the man. There are places that the gifting can never go. The gifting of God is a good thing, all right? But these giftings are usually vindicators, they're usually justifiers, they're usually confirmers of what is already affirmed in our spirit. Our affirmation is not in the giftings, our affirmation is in the knowledge of God. It's that place where a man must know their God and because of that they shall do mighty exploits, all right? We're in a time where we cannot ignore the reality of the fact that to many people who open the Bible, the Bible is not open to. There are many people who read, they search out, they have books and pens, they try to write all manner of notes. Books have been written, 
and some of the books have actually destroyed than they have built. You understand? Because we have a certain understanding, a certain interpretation of what it means to be taught. It is easy for people to just want to go to a church and just have a service of deliverance where they're casting out devils out of them for 20 hours than sitting before a teacher. You understand? He says in that day their ears will grow dull of hearing. Their ears will grow dull of hearing. And one of the things that Satan has robbed of this generation and dispensation is attention. Many people, many of us cannot attend to a thing deliberately and consistently when it touches something that applies ourselves to reading. Because there are a lot of distractions in the spirit realm. One of the biggest distractions of the spirit realm is social media. For you who is watching or even listening to me, can you ask yourself the last time you actually sat with a book in your hands and read for one or two hours, non-stop, uninterrupted? But it's easy to watch videos. It's easy to read you know, stories. And I don't want you to think that I'm judging you, but I'm trying to tell you just how much destructed the atmosphere of the spirit is. The atmosphere is so destructed by a lot of things that take our attention and dissuade us from the things we must truly attend to. One time the Spirit of the Lord was telling me, and he said, this is so demonic, you know, more so for the Christians. It is so demonic that you can sit on your phone for three, four hours five hours a day, six hours or seven hours of your 24 hours of a day, and you are watching or attending to things that cannot connect you eternally, but yet you cannot sit for one hour or 30 minutes simply to look into something that should give you life. If it is robbery, the devil has actually robbed. If it is stealing, the devil has actually stolen of our attention. If it is killing, the devil has actually killed of our time. If it is destruction, the devil has actually invested a lot in destroying our minds into understanding God. And that's what's happening in our dispensation. That is why we don't see the power and the glory of God. Like we must see, people do not read the word. Okay? And if it is something that I have to preach for the rest of my life, I feel that that emphasis for me in my spirit is strong because it's one of those things God has mandated me to give into this generation. Part of what makes me this apostle, this apostolic voice, when he was speaking to me years ago, there were instructions that I received. And one of the things that God instructed me was, he said, go cause my people to fall in love with the word. Let me give you words throughout your spirit that when a man will hear them, he will gain a hunger. He will start a sudden thirst of reading the word. And if I can do that, then I'm doing exactly what God called me to do. And that I'll continue to do well by his grace. Now, this is why these things continue opening for us by the Spirit to understand. Why would God get this whole land Moriah? Because the whole mystery is there. The whole revelation is there. He has told you that you've come to that city Zion, to Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. He says you are in the company of innumerable angels. The angelics are present in that realm. He says, and to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, he says, which are written in heaven. He says, those are also available in that realm. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. They are in that realm. And he says, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling. And he says, and that blood is speaking better things than the blood of Abel. God is saying, what's important on this mountain is what is spoken. Is what is spoken. If you can connect to what is spoken, you will not lose out on what God is doing. The holistic activity of the Godhead is connected and imbued in what God is speaking. There's a blood on this mountain that is speaking better things. What does the blood of Abel speak? The blood of Abel speaks condemnation. The blood of Abel is speaking judgment. The blood of Abel seeks vindication for its death to seek to kill the man that killed it. It seeks to reward the wicked in his sin. It seeks to deal with the sinner as he has dealt with the world. It seeks to make you pay for your wrong. But God is saying that there is a blood that is speaking better things because we are under a new covenant, a new dispensation of the Spirit. That is why it was in the land of Moriah that we see Abraham when God wants to enter another level of distinction 
in covenant with Abraham. He's tested in the land of Moriah in Genesis 22 verses 2. The Bible says, in that same land, God tells Abraham, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, he says, and get thee into the land of what? Moriah, in the land where you will see me, in the land where you will perceive me, in the land where the things touching me will be revealed to you, and take him there as a sacrifice and offer him up there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I'll tell thee. Of course, he was in the land and the mountain of Moriah. Now we see Abraham taking a seed, his son, his only son, as a sacrifice in the place where he should see God. No wonder Abraham, even though in his heart he killed that boy, fully obeyed the command of God and testation at that hour. But he received back not only his son, but I remember the words that he tells him when they're on the way. He tells him, my son, God shall provide himself a lamb. He shall provide himself a lamb. Now, does that shock you that the Christ becomes the lamb that was slain for the propitiation of our sins? He's saying that there is a story that is bigger than I. That you and I, my son, are simply a typification of. We're simply a miniature picture of the bigger one. When you zoom out in history and generations to come, they will see that my sacrifice of you was the ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb. And we see that Jesus Christ, the Lamb which was slain before the foundation of the world, he was originally the idea and mind of God, but he could only draw this picture through our father Abraham. And then Christ comes as that Lamb that takes our place, for we could have been sacrificed that day. You and I would have shed our blood and died, but God substituted Isaac and substituted a man who laughs and then put a lamb to shed his blood. So as he was weeping, as his son, Jesus Christ, was being given as an ultimate sacrifice, we received joy. And that is the essence of the kingdom. It is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It is that joy of salvation. I said you will draw from the wells of salvation with joy. He says with joy you shall draw from the wells of salvation. How do you draw from these wells? Because you carry the spirit of joy. It is the Isaac which laughs. It is the one which should have been taken as a lamb to the slaughter because it was supposed to die. But God instead removed that and got a lamb from the thicket and they gave it as a sacrifice. And Abraham returned back home and he says, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. And the Bible tells us later in Galatians, and not as of seeds, as of many, but as one seed which is in Christ. He's telling us that Christ is showing you, or Christ is a typification, is a picture of what was done. He's the sacrifice, but now he is coming through the picture of Isaac as one which loves you and I, are now put there as objects of mercy. And this lamb now comes to take our place. Now we are in the seed called of Isaac. He says, in Isaac shall thy seed be called because we are fruits of that redemption. We are the reason that ransom took place. What a glory. And all of it takes place in the land where men perceive or supposed to perceive and see God, get the revealed things or the revelation of the person of God. It is in Moriah, Jerusalem, that Jesus Christ is brought up as a child. It is in Moriah that Jesus Christ is wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. He's beaten. He's loathed, he's smitten and stricken, that men think that he's smitten and afflicted of God. But in there, he's purchasing our eternal salvation. It is in Moriah that Jesus Christ is put on the cross at Calvary in Golgotha. Golgotha was one of the peaks in the mountain of Moriah. It's there that our Jesus Christ shed his blood for you and I. You start to see that Jerusalem becomes a bigger thing than just being the city because it's in a land where men should see God. No wonder world religions, Islam is fighting for Jerusalem because they know that the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has a connection with the very land with where we perceive God. He's not going to come through anywhere. He's going to come through Jerusalem. The temple is being rebuilt. There's a reconciliation in Jerusalem where his own are being reconciled back to their God. Jerusalem is a very important place for the Christian. I can never tell you enough what it took for the president of America to wake up one day and say that he has recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Praise God for that. Any Christian should understand that. We celebrate God for that. It took so much. Many forces will fight that and they'll continue to fight that. But there's some way bigger than what even Trump did. There's some way bigger than the world leaders are doing and some this city will outlive, and the testimony of that city will still go upward, will outgrow every detractor and hater. Why? Because God 
has put something sacred there. It is a place where we see him. It is a place where we see him. And any other religion that seeks to extend that, that religion is seeking to take the testimony of the Christ so it is easier for them to relate with this man that they will never understand like we do. Why? Because to us, he died. To them, he did not die. He was just a prophet who was substituted. To them, there was a man who was substituted for them to Islam. Jesus was substituted with a certain man and which man we don't even know very well. But to us, he is our substitution. He took our place. He took our place. So we see the shedding of that blood becoming a revelation. It gives us a certain understanding in this newness of life that is way bigger than we can ever explain it. How can somebody sit and say, oh, I don't even believe in the Bible. I even doubt some words. These things cannot be coincidence. I have already told you that destinies are in the naming of things. God did not name Moriah simply as Moriah. Jerusalem, the teaching of peace, was simply not just a place of peace. Zion, the high speak of God's presence and the temple built there. All of these things were ordained before our time because God was speaking a deeper message, a deeper understanding than some of us are able to fathom right now, than many of us are able to articulate with right now. And that is why if we go back to the verses 22 in Hebrews 12, when he tells them you have come to Zion, and he tells them the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and in verses 23 to the general assemblies and the church of the firstborn, he says, which are written in heaven, and he talks of God, the judge of all things, and to the spirits of just men that are made perfect, he speaks of Jesus, which is the mediator in that dispensation of the new covenant and the blood of the sprinkling and that blood which speaketh better things than the blood of Cain and Abel. He's trying to tell you that that blood of Abel was judgment. The voice, the message that is being spoken of the hour is a message of grace and forgiveness, mercy for all who come through. And then he gives the bomb on 25 and he says, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. See that you don't refuse the message of grace. See that you don't refuse the message of grace. Because the man speaking on that mountain is not seeking to repay you for your sin. The man speaking on that mountain is not seeking to destroy you for what you have done. The man, the blood, the voice speaking on that mountain is a voice that is inviting you to love. It's a voice that is inviting you to forgiveness. It is a voice that is inviting you to mercy. It is a voice that is inviting you to a glory that you have never dreamed of before. It is a voice that is inviting you to the instruction of peace. The Bible says Jerusalem is translated as the teaching of peace. And Jesus wept, the Bible says, he says, for had they known the ways of peace, the things that be for their peace. Jesus is weeping because they don't understand what it means to have a certain peace in God. Doubting nothing. That even when the doctor gives you the worst news in the world, there is a certain peace in your spirit that passes all understanding that guards your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That even though we have a season of COVID, and yes, people are dying, unfortunately, we're praying for the families that have lost their dear ones, but there is this fortification in your spirit that God will see us through, that we shall come out better than the way we entered in. That peace of God that passes all understanding, that guards your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus, it's all because God has taught us a certain way. It's all because God has instructed us a certain way. It's all because we've learned to hear God a certain way. The grace message is not just, a, some people say, oh, you know, when you preach grace, you're telling people to sin. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. Grace sustained us. Jesus did not come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. He came to give us life. That is bigger. It's way deeper than many people can ever articulate. The grace message is not there to make a man sin or for you to walk in sin or for you to give excuse for your inefficiencies. No, it is there to qualify you, but not only to qualify you, to give you that seal that should fall a man or a woman which is under grace, which is living a holy life, but by the grace of God, which is living a life of faith, but by the grace of God, which is living a life of love, but by the grace of God, which is living a life of power, which is living a life of testimony, but by the grace of God. There are things, if you never learn how to yield into that, your life will be complicated. Why are ministries growing? They're growing because they understand this message. Why do people see signs, miracles, and wonders? Because we have understood this message. We've understood this message. We have understood the message that sets you free. Jesus says, that's why you have come to. That's why you have come to. 
You've come to that realm of grace. Grace is a realm you have entered. It's not just a doctrine you embrace. No, it is a realm you have entered. If you teach the law right now, you're simply saying, I'm not embracing the realm that is open to me. But to God, this is the realm that is open to you. Because Jesus, like Paul says, was set forth before you all, crucified for your sex. You cannot doubt grace when you see what this man did. For while we were yet sinners, the Bible says Christ died. There is a power. There is a power that we can never express, fully express in words, in what Jesus Christ did. And some trample on that. And take the Son of God lightly. The blood of the covenant lightly. This is what Paul is telling us. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. Because he is speaking. And is speaking every other day. And his words are good. They are the good news. They are the good news. So he continues in 25. says, okay, says, see that you refuse him not that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth. Much more shall we not escape if we turn, the Bible says, away from him that speaketh from heaven. That means our message is from above. Our message is no longer earthly. Paul says that our conversation is from heaven, from whence we look. From whence we look. That means when you connect to the dispensation of the New Testament, the grace message, you start to receive fresh manna from heaven. Your revelations are things that are not on CDs. They're not normal. They're not in the simple books of the world. No, they are deep. They're deeply connected to the spirit and heart of God. And that heavenly flow is endless. He's speaking every time. He's speaking every hour. The book, the word is open to you. Don't you know that people are bound because they don't know the truth? Or that what they assume to know as truth is not true. For if it was true, it would work for them. He says, for ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It shall make you free. How can you not love the word? How can you not read the word? How can you not love people who teach the word? How can you not fall in love with people who open your eyes to the things that you are called into? To the things that were ordained for your spaces? How can you fail when you've connected to the word this way? It's not possible. I always tell people, when you see people struggling a certain way and they have challenges they will never come out of, it's because of how they have related with their teacher. The person of the Holy Spirit primarily comes to teach you all things, the Bible says, and to remind you that which you have forgotten. I cannot emphasize enough the power of teaching. And that is why I have not seen a great movement of the Spirit without great teachers. Revivals cannot be sustained when minds are not reformed. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's like having a car and you don't know how to drive it. How will you move that car when you're not taught, when you're not instructed, skillful in the driving of that car? These issues we hear of COVID, these things are nothing when the church, or if the church can hang in and connect to the word of God a certain way. Now, in the New Testament, you see, it's no longer about, please make sure you understand it, it's so available that he's asking the church not to refuse it. There are people who have set themselves against the message of grace, against the ministers of grace. And some of them, it's just baseless rumor. They hear that somebody say, oh, they read, Someone on social media of somebody who's possessed by another spirit. And it's, oh, this minister is this, this ministry is that. And you simply believe it. When will you ever judge yourself? Oh, but it's because you don't know the word. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, I judge as I hear. If you've not heard, how can you judge? Some are so quick in judging because you don't even know the word. At the first and second admonishing of a man regarding a heretic. If you've not admonished a man, how are you even calling him cult and heretic? And some of you can even reach these people that you accuse for preaching the love of God. And like one man wrote and sang, Redeeming love shall be our theme, and it shall be until the day we leave this earth. It's redeeming love. It's redeeming love. This is the love that never fails. 1 Corinthians 13.8 This is the love that covers a multitude of sins. 
This is the love that constrains a believer. If we are not teaching that, what are we teaching? The law cannot constrain. In fact, the law is given that all men will be guilty. And that they will not have any excuse before God to need the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus now is the one that takes over by the teaching of faith. Because the law as the schoolmaster. The Bible says that led you to Christ. But now that you have Christ, you are no longer bound again to the schoolmaster. He's saying, I've invited you on a mountain that is higher. Not the other one you could not touch. Not the one that burnt with brimstone and was full of judgment. That people could not even hold their ears to hear. Why? Because everything they heard was judging them. Even Moses was afraid of the same dispensation. Because when you hear the law, the Bible tells you, do not kill. But it says, but if you hate your brother, you kill him. And he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is sin. So the law was not the compass that led you to do good. No, it was the voice that told you what was good and what was bad. But it wasn't the strengthener of the individual to do good. With the law, there is no strength for us to do good. It simply tells us this is bad, this is good. But it doesn't give you the power and the grace to do good. It's only through the person of Jesus Christ, upheld by his loving mercies, exceeding love. It's by that that we are saved. It's by grace that we are saved. And not of our own, the Bible says that we should boast. How do we enter salvation and then become boastful and even judge others? Oh, he says, knowest thou, man of God, that in what you judge another, you condemn yourself? In what you judge another, you condemn yourself? You condemn yourself? Because you are susceptible to the very sin you judge another man of. How is this hard for people to see? I'm talking to those pastors who go talking about fellow believers, the weaknesses of other people in the church. You are condemned of the very thing, but it is because you're not looking into yourself. It's because you're not looking into yourself. If you read Romans 2 verse 1, he speaks about it, okay, the message version. He speaks as those people who are on a dark spiral downward, but if you think, okay, he says, if you think that that leaves you out on the high ground where you can point your finger at others, okay, think again. He says, every time you criticize someone, he says, you condemn yourself. It takes one to know another, and the message version says, Judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection in your own crimes and misdemeanors. And in verses 2 he says, but God isn't so easily diverted. He says he sees through all such smoke screens and holds you to what you have done. In the verses 3 he says, you didn't think, did you, that when you point your finger at others, you'll distract God from seeing all your misdoings and from coming down on you high. Huh? The fourth verse says, oh, did you think that because he is such a nice God, he would let you off the hook? Better think one through. The Bible says from the beginning, God is kind, but is not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into radical life changing. That's the embracing of the grace. But when you think that you're so much on the side of the law, you are the police of every man who preaches wrong. You are the police of every sister who does what wrong. You are the police of who is right. You are the teacher of who is this. You are the one who knows who is wrong. You're the one who knows who is the false prophet, the false teacher, the false evangelist. You are sent as God's messenger. Although I have not seen it in the callings of God. I have not seen men who God has sent to be bigger brothers of others. But some of you have become bigger brothers and bigger sisters to watch out who is wrong and who is right. You're even carrying sticks of your tongue. Oh, you have platforms. You're on social media. You are on YouTube. And you slash and lash and kill and stab your own and bad mouth because you're a bishop, you're a pastor, you're a prophet, you're an evangelist. No, that does not hide God away from who you really are. And sometimes we are so on the seat of judgment that we cannot put the light on our own filthy selves without this God. For if it had not been God, if the Lord of Sabbath had not preserved us, all of us would have been like Sodom. And we would have been eaten up and fired up like Gomorrah. But it's only because of his loving mercies that he has drawn us. So you don't take it for granted that another man is still trying to walk that walk that you are on. Then how do you know, man of God, that the man who is walking behind you, a couple of years ago, will be ahead of you? Oh, how blind. Oh, how blind. But we're not blind not only to the realities of this God. We are blind to the mountain with which we have been invited in the land we are at, the heavenly city in which God has called us. He says, do not refuse 
the grace of God that is speaking. Do not set yourself against divine grace. Do not set yourself against mercy. Some people are against the long suffering of God. The Bible says, forgetting not that the goodness of God leadeth men to repentance. They despise it. When God is extending mercy to another man, you are quick in judging for the destruction of the same man God is extending love to. And that is why heaven will shock many. That is why God has made it his own business to use the least expected. He chose the foolish things of this world that he might shame the wise. He says he chose many men that were not wise after the flesh, not mighty after the flesh, not noble or honorable after the flesh, but he called us. If you're listening to me and you know you're called of God, I want you to understand you were so damn weak. You were not that noble like you think. You were not that wise like you think. It is out of that weakness that God saw you, that clay in which he had molded you. And then he said, no, let me put some light into this thing. Let me put some glory onto this man. Let me put some understanding on this woman. And that is the humility to which you have to walk with God. James calls it the meekness of wisdom. When you understand the wisdom with which God has extended mercy to you, you don't try to be humble. You find yourself that you're humble. Why? Because you understand that you did nothing to be invited on that table. And definitely, you're not going to do anything to be sustained on that table except to continue trusting in him except to continue trusting in him. So he's telling us, do not refuse. Why? Because he says, those that refused did not escape. He says, do we think we shall escape if we refuse to embrace that message? Verse 25. He says, we should not refuse him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him who spoke, the Bible says, on earth, much more shall we not if we turn away from him that speaketh in heaven. Whose voice, the Bible says, shook the earth. But now, the Bible says, he hath promised. Now, he hath promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but the heaven. He's saying that this particular message is not only going to shake earth, it's going to shake heaven. The Bible says, and this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of the things which are made. The Bible says that those things which cannot be shaken, will remain. And he says, therefore, since we have received such a kingdom, verse 28, we have received that glory, which cannot be moved. He says, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews 12 is talking about the place he has invited you, and that place of grace. He's talking about the place where we should see and perceive God as he is in the revelation of who he is in the city of the teaching of his peace on the highest peak of the mountain where he is is a temple and in that temple where there's much teaching of his ways and paths of his law and his instructions and he says there we shall find blessing there we shall find deliverance there we shall find salvation there we shall find life. What am I trying to tell you? Grace is not a doctrine. Grace is a place you have been invited into. Don't refuse the teaching of his grace. Don't ignore men who teach God's love. Don't throw away God's love and embrace the law. It will kill you. The letter killeth, the Bible says, but the spirit giveth life. Churches are dying because men have refused that voice. People are dying in their body because they have refused that voice. Businesses are failing because they have refused that voice. Your children are failing because you have refused that voice. Your careers are falling in shutters because you have refused that voice. Your life is out of order because you've refused that voice. And God is telling you, you don't seek it. It has already invited you. That's where you are. You are in the place where you must see God. You are in the place where you receive from heaven fresh manna. If you have understood this message, you will connect to the spirit of revelation. Because revelation is a spirit. 
He's in the person of the Holy Spirit. When you meet him, all the things he will teach you, the things he will say to you, the things that he will open your eyes to, things you could never read, things that no man has ever taught you, things that no book could have clearly articulated. It's the stirring in that heart that makes you fall in love with God. To know that he is not only for me, but he is with me. He cares for me deeply, and he wills that I may know him more passionately, more intimately. I wish I could help somebody understand the peace in that city. The instructions. Sometimes I'm seated alone and he starts to speak. And I know that that is where I belong. Sometimes I'm in my bed in the night. And I wake up to this voice speaking and I have to write until morning. Because this voice is inviting me always. Sometimes I open the Bible and as I'm opening it, he tells me, don't miss that. Don't skip that. Don't ignore that. That is where I'm taking you. And I start to see when it comes to the sick, it's effortless to heal. Because I'm invited in the teaching of how to heal the sick. It's effortless to be rich because I know what he has done for my wealth. And I mean that attacks don't come or that things sometimes don't hit my door. But it only means that I know what to do. God has made you a victor. That is why people get depression. Acute depression and they run mad and they go to split personalities, bipolar, schizophrenic and psychomaniac. Do you know why? Because God has not created the human being to carry a certain pain. He had not carried a human being. He has not made a human being to carry a certain darkness. He has not made a human being. He has not created us to carry a certain pain. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. So when we see Jesus, the mediator of this covenant, we see why all the operation of this man took place in Moriah, why the growing up and the raising of this man is in Moriah, why the death and the crucifixion is in Moriah, why he will come back through Moriah, why it is a special place and a central place for our faith, but bigger than the physical land. We're talking of the heavenly Moriahs. We're talking about the heavenly Zions. We're talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. He says, that's where I've called you. Do not refuse. Do not refuse. Do not resist that voice. This season, more than ever before, God is calling us to hear him. To hear him when he speaks. To connect with him when he's ministering. To relate with him in whatever he has called us individually, whether you have a song or you're a worship, I'm a teacher and business people, wherever it is, the world has to hear God again. The time has come where you can get in your house and switch off that telephone, except if you're reading some spiritual of it, and just take off that one minute, that one hour, and just be with your God. To hear him speak to you like a friend would speak to you. People who speak to you on Facebook, you will never know. And some of them don't even know you. And some of them don't even like you. They don't like you. But you can be convinced that because the tick is up, therefore they like you. Some of the people I'm ministering to every day, I might never meet in the flesh. But in the spirit, there's some that connects us. Some are not born Ugandans. Some are foreign lands. Some are British. Some are American. Some are Ghanaian. Some are, you know, Chinese. But when I speak, there's a language that connects us. Because we're all invited on that wall. We're all invited in that space. It's only in the church that the dividing walls of racism can be broken. Because when we're invited there in Christ, he says there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. The world cannot get rid of racism. It has to begin in the church. And sadly, one Martin Luther said that America is most divided on Sunday morning. And those of you who are mature understand what I'm saying. But... The time has come where that reconciliation can only come through the glorious gospel. It's thing that has given me the opportunity to go on foreign lands and platforms of men who don't even speak the language 
I speak or some even can't connect with my accent, but there's something in me that connects to something so old in them, and it's bigger than color, it's bigger than tribe, it's bigger than skin. Revivals are birthed that way. When our message can transcend cultures, colors, affiliations, and at the end, it's not Grace Lubega or any man watching me or prophet so-and-so, evangelist so-and-so. The end is Christ and him crucified. That's the reconciliation. He says, do not refuse that voice. The message is available for you. Father, we thank you. Because you are speaking. You are speaking louder in this time than you have ever spoken in human history. And men and women are leaning to you to hear your voice. The Bible says, oh, that we may hear your voice and leave. It's your voice that gives us life. The challenges we're going through individually are just waiting for one voice. That clarity is there and we can embrace what you are speaking. And it doesn't matter what we are going through. There are answers even for the worst curse in the world. The Jesus we're talking about raised a man who was dead days ago. That same God put flesh on dry bones in a valley. And a prophet looked as God was combining these sinews and muscles and they became a living army. Only you, God, can, in the words of Ezekiel. But now he has chosen to partner with you. To live in you, move in you, and have your own being in him. And my prayer for those that are watching me right now, may God connect you to this source. May a spirit of revelation and vision star through your life like never before. May the world of the spirit be open to you. May the word of God and the Bible be so openly clear to you that every time you open the Bible, it's open to you. You don't open it, it's open to you. May God give you understanding. May you understand why you were called for the hour. And may men embrace this message even as we teach it in the simplicity. I decree that your houses are healed. Your families are healed. Your careers are healed. Your finances are restored. Your visions are recalibrated. Your ministries are elevated. You will see signs, miracles, and wonders like you have never seen or dreamed. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. If you're sick in your body, you're healed. You're healed. Just receive your healing. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to invite you to the mountain where we receive directly from heaven. For the voice of old was on the earth. The law was on the earth. The tablets of stone, they were on the earth. From heaven but on the earth. And constantly referred to as they were on the earth. This thing God has given you, import stuff from heaven every day. You will receive fresh manna. And ask me, how do you read the Bible? And I tell him, look, it's not about how I read the Bible. It's how the Bible reads me. It's how it's open to me every time I look at it. And there are many people who have grown into that. Join it, connect to it, grow into it every other day. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You repeat these words after me. You say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. You shed your blood for me and that you were raised for my glory. And today, now, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. The message you have Bonnie. just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.